Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, November 8th, 2007. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, mead maker Mike Lozano guides us through the results of his mead experiment with beer yeast. We'll evaluate seven beer yeast strains and two mead strains to compare how they ferment the same must. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. Now, I want to point you to the latest episode of Big Foamy Head. Rick and Dick of Big Foamy Head attended a dinner in the lead-up to the Great American Beer Festival uh, that was hosted by Rob Todd of Allagash, Adam Avery of Avery Brewing, and Sam Caligioni of Dogfish Head. Rick and Dick got some uh, good sound and some good interviews with those rock stars of brewing. Part of the uh, they call themselves the Brett Pack instead of the Brat Pack or the the Rat Pack. It's the Brett Pack. Uh, check out BigFoamyHead.com uh, for that one. And that's a good one. Before I open the mailbag, I want to offer you a challenge. Steve Wilkes and I were commiserating the other day about uh, brew days that have gone wrong. And, uh, you know, I, th- I thought this would be a good idea for a show. So what I want to do is uh, have you send me an email with your worst brew day experience and how you were able to salvage the brew if you were able to. Kind of get bonus points if you were able to pull it out before it <laughs> slammed into the ground. Uh, everybody has, you know, some experience with um, overflowing brew pots or erupting fermenters or similar things, and uh, we want to hear about them. We think it would be fun. So send your bad brew day experience to james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and we'll read our favorites on a show in the near future. Now, here's a story about a brew day that went right. Dan from Statsburg, New York, writes, I made an oatmeal stout. Half the batch I bottled with coffee-infused vodka, and half without it. Both were spectacular, even though a little light on the mouthfeel side for me, Dan says. For the infusion on the brew day, I took one cup of coffee beans, ground them up, and funneled into a 16-ounce Grolsch bottle. I then topped off the bottle with some cheap vodka. Two weeks later, before I bottled, I used my coffee maker to filter the newly flavored vodka from the, cro- the coffee grounds, I simply poured the vodka into the filter, which then dripped into the pot. Dan says, when completed, I transferred the vodka into a Pyrex cup, yielding about 10 ounces. Bottled as usual. However, after filling half of my bottles, I gingerly stirred in the vodka and completed the bottling. A few weeks later, the stouts were great. You could really distinguish the difference between the two varieties. So there you go. There's another, yet another way to... Uh, to use coffee in beers. Don from Boston writes with a question, is it possible to over-oxygenate your wort? I recently purchased an oxygen air tank and a stone to aerate my wort, and I give my wort about a minute of pure O2, which, from what I have read, results in nearly 20 parts per million of oxygen in the wort. I was told by someone that I should only run the oxygen for 20 to 30 seconds and that it's possible for me to over-oxygenate the wort and cause off flavors. Well, uh, if you'll remember, when I talked to David Loxton from Y Yeast the most recent time, uh, we did talk about this, I believe. Um, If we're talking about the initial aeration with oxygen before the start of fermentation, I don't think you have to worry about over-oxygenating your wort. According to David, the yeast will use what oxygen they need, and the rest of the O2 will be kind of blown out a solution as the fermentation gets going. So you don't have to worry about uh, the oxygen um, causing oxidation later on. Now, I personally run oxygen into my beer for a couple of minutes for five gallons, and I get good results. I'm just, I just, (laughs) as long as I'm doing it, I want to, you know, make sure that they have plenty of oxygen. So um, besides, it, it seems the difference between what you're doing uh, which you say is about a minute, and the 20 to 30 seconds, which is what you've heard is recommended, 
you know, it doesn't seem like it's that much different. So, I don't know, especially in high-gravity beers, your yeast needs to be properly aerated. So, I say don't be shy with the oxygen in the beginning. Now, if we're talking about after fermentation starts, uh, then that's when I've heard it's not good to be continuing the aeration. But, you know, haven't done any experiments on that to see um, to see if that's true or not. So, anyway, don't be shy with the oxygen before the fermentation starts. On the topic of uh, labeling bottles, Tom writes from, he says, near beautiful Folsom Prison. <laughs> Tom says about labeling bottles, forget it. Don't waste your time. He says use a rubber stamp to mark the bottle cap. Tom says he uses a an applicable letter or symbol to differentiate between his brews. And Ryan Wilson, who is our beekeeper buddy from Rockford, Michigan, you you can hear him in the archives talking about beer keeping, or beer keeping, <laughs> that too, beekeeping. <laughs> a little Freudian slip there. Uh, Ryan says, I listened to some of the labeling ideas, and I thought I would share my own. I use three-quarter inch round labels to stick to the tops of bottles. I think it's Avery number 5408. I can use them for my flip-top bottles or those with traditional caps. There isn't a lot of room, but I can fit the name of the beer, date brewed, uh, date bottled, and the ABV. So, there you go. I have to say that uh, I'm more on the uh, cap labeling side of things myself, but I just use a Sharpie, a Sharpie magic marker, and uh, and write the batch number and, a, and some sort of abbreviation of the, the name of the beer, the style of the beer on the cap. Uh, although, you know, there, there have been some great labeling suggestions uh, that have been coming out in the past few episodes, so I may want to uh, look into some of those if I want to give away beer for the holidays. One more tip from the mailbag. Gavin writes in from Washington, D.C. Uh, he says via Northwest Ireland. Uh, Gavin says get a couple of boxes from an office or office supply place that used to be home to reams of paper. These boxes fit 48 bottles nearly perfectly with just a bit of extra room. Line the bottom with an old towel or some other absorbent material. Put your bottles in and fill them. You can fill all your bottles in a rapid manner. They won't tip over. And if you spill a bit, it's not on your floor. <laughs> Better yet, once they're all filled and capped, you can put the lid on the box and have an extra layer of sun and temperature protection. And it's an easy way to transport your brew. These boxes are rugged, usually free, and work great. Thanks for the tip, Gavin. I, uh, I need a, a way to organize my bottles in my basement. I've got stacks of six-packs down there waiting for beer. And uh, it'd be good to have uh, something where I can clean those up a little bit. Now, when uh, Stephen, Steve Wilkes and I went out to Denver for the uh, National Homebrewers Conference uh, this year, we had the opportunity to go to Mike Lozano's house for a wonderful dinner and a mead tasting, which you can find in our archives. Since then, Mike's been working on an experiment to see how several beer yeasts will compare when they've been used to ferment a mead. Now, I asked uh, Steve Wilkes to step in again to help with the tasting. Well, Mike Lozano, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. It's good to be here. And joining me now here in the studio is uh, my good buddy Steve Wilkes. James, it's nice to be back. Mike, it's nice to welcome you back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you. And uh, we've got we're talking meads again. And last time we were together, we had the opportunity to taste a bunch of your uh, different meads, and they all were wonderful, from my recollection. They were. And uh, now we're we're on more of a scientific bent because this is a, an experiment to uh, test the effect of different yeast strains on uh, the same batch of must. And, Mike, can you just uh, run us down the experiment? Uh, how did you come up with it? Uh, uh, what are the parameters? And just give us the, give us the rundown. Well, actually, I can't take 100% credit for coming up with the experiment. I got the idea, actually, from you from your uh, mead yeast experiment that you did back in February and uh, March of this year. Well, what takes it? Yeah. 
So I thought that, huh, that was a great experiment, and I wanted to kind of take it to the next level. Um, my interest was in finding out, well, I've, I've been using wine yeasts for all of my meads, and you had used a, a few beer yeasts for your meads in that experiment. I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. So I then attended the National Homebrewers Conference here in Denver and met up with two of the guys from White East, uh, Greg and John. And I said, well, you know, I had this idea for this experiment to do. I was going to do some ale yeasts for my meads, compare that maybe with some wine yeasts or some mead yeasts, and just to to compare and contrast to see how the different uh, beer yeasts may or may not impart flavor on the meads. And they loved the idea. They sent me out some uh, some free yeasts to use in the little activator packs, and uh, we went from there. So what I've done is I mixed up a 7.5-gallon batch of mead using orange blossom honey, which is a very common honey used in making mead, the original gravity was 1120 for the whole batch. I added in some pH buffering with some potassium carbonate, added some nutrient in just to make sure that the, the yeast got up to a healthy start. I split the 7.5-gallon batch into nine separate carboys, one-gallon carboys, and then aerated each one and pitched a different yeast, a different Y yeast yeast, into each carboy. And just let it go. Uh, a couple of months later, when everything was done, I did treat it with uh, with some stabilizers because I knew I was going to be shipping it. And the last thing I wanted was a bottle bomb in the mail. That would be very bad. So I stabilized the meads, bottled them, shipped them out, and uh, they've been sitting in the refrigerator and pulled them out, and we're getting ready to taste. So we, we do owe uh, some thanks to the Y Yeast guys for helping to uh, to sponsor the the experiment tonight. Thanks, Y East. Thank you. Yes. And uh, talk about did you did you just use a, a whole activator pack in each uh, gallon of uh, or each uh, carboy of mead? It wasn't actually an activator pack. It was the smaller packs, ah. the uh, propagator packs. Okay. It was. It's actually. It's like. A, it's about one third of what you would find in an activator pack. So uh, we didn't feel like we needed an entire activator pack for a one ga- for a one gallon batch or less. It would have been a little overkill. So they sent out the smaller packs, which worked fine. And that amount of yeast uh, had no problem with with that uh, gravity of mead at that uh, volume. Absolutely none. In fact, I think you'll find the, some of the results very surprising. Uh, and, of course, they say that the activator pack is enough to inoculate five gallons of mead, and we're using less than one-fifth of that volume, but we're pitching a little a little more than one-third of the yeast. So it was it was really, really good. Uh, I did aerate, again, very well, 30 seconds for one-gallon batch, just to be sure, added in the nutrient, and they took off uh, very, very quickly. Great. Well, what uh, what strains are we looking at tonight? So the strains we're looking at tonight, uh, there are two strains of mead yeasts. Those are the Y yeast, uh, sweet mead yeast, and the dry mead yeast. That's, uh, that would be 4184 and 4632, respectively. So we've got those in as kind of control yeast, so we can get an idea of what y, the Y yeast mead yeast tastes like. And then we have seven different ale yeasts of different types and different strengths, uh, starting with the 1056 American Ale, uh, the 1388 Belgian Strong Ale, 1728 Scottish Ale, 1762 Belgian Al- excuse me Belgian Abbey Two, 1968 London ESB. The 2565 Kolsch and the 3056 Bavarian Wheat Blend. So the idea there, we wanted to, when I was talking to Greg and John, we wanted to kind of go out in the outer edges a little bit with some of these, just to see how uh, interesting of a taste that we could get. Do you, Do you know if they've done anything like this themselves? Have they talked about that? 
No, they actually hadn't. In fact, that's why one of the reasons why they were so interested in it. They had never heard of anyone using it purposely using an ale yeast for a mead. <laughs> Uh, they, you know, if, if there's some hanging around and someone just thought, oh, I'll just use this yeast instead, woof, you know, there it goes. Um, I have heard of people using Fleischmann's bread yeast for mead. Mm-hmm. There are some recipes out there. Uh, the One of the most common ones that you find on the Internet is one called Joe's Ancient Orange. Uh, but as if you research about the Joe's Ancient Orange and the Fleischmann's yeast, uh, what you discover is that your mileage may vary is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, Steve and I, I don't know if you if you saw the uh, the Basic Brewing video episode where Steve and I experimented with uh, making bread with beer yeast and, and beer with bread yeast. But Yes, we, I did. We had pretty good luck with, with our Fleischmann's uh, uh, yeast. So I know it's not made for beer, but uh, we just happened to have good luck with that one. So... Yeah, and I think a lot of the with the with the Joe's Ancient Orange and whatnot is that, uh, as we discussed before, with mead you have to have some other stuff in there to feed the yeast. It needs extra nutrients, and the Joe's Ancient Orange does not have any nutrients in it. In fact, one of the things about it is that you're supposed to avoid it. Hmm. So, it makes perfect sense. Well, we've got our Steve has arranged the nine bottles in kind of a um, in a in a perfect square there. And uh, it reminds me kind of the it's the Hollywood squares of beer. So uh, shall we take Paul Lynn to block or? Uh... Well, he is fruity and citrusy. So. Right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do what a lot of your typical wine tasters will do, and we're actually going to start with the drier meads, and we're going to work our way backwards to the sweeter meads. So. Since the original gravity was the same, what that means is we're going to start with the more alcoholic meads and go backwards to the less alcoholic, sweeter meads. So uh, we're, and I'm not going to tell you which, meat, which yeast that we're tasting until after you've tasted it. And uh, we'll go over what the uh, final gravity was uh, and the alcohol by volume and what the actual ABV of that particular strain was according to Y yeast. And I think what you're going to find is some very, very interesting uh, results there. So we're actually going to start with bottle number nine. Oh, okay. Bottle well, number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. <laughs> nine. <laughs> if you play this episode backwards, this section will... Whoa! You'll find, yeah. <laughs> that went quick. Yeah, we, we're actually... We're pouring just... Uh, no, that that may be a little more than an ounce. That's a healthy that's healthy a, portion there. That's about, an, about an ounce. But uh, I actually have uh, sanitized bottle caps here in the room and my bottle capper. Oh, so, I wondered what all that was about. So what we're going to do is um, to save the mead uh, because we're we're not going to. What's nine times twelve? Um, yeah, more than I could handle in a month. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to drink all that. So uh, we're going to recap oh. these after we're done. So I'm measuring out a small amount into a kind of a larger mouth glass and throwing it around to get it warmed and get some scent off of this. Hmm. This, um, I'm getting a bit of, um, cooked corn Mm -hmm. smell, like a DMS off this one. Should be. Yeah, I, I am too. I get a nice honey note, but at the front, definitely some corn. And that, mm. of course, will add, if you let that sit long enough, that'll go out. Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, that's delicious. It is hot, though. It's a, they're not, not, when I say hot, it's, the alcohol presence is there. It's not as hot as that old peg leg that we had made. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know what I mean? I'm sorry, it was the old card table. <laughs> One drinking your legs fold mm. up. <laughs> Now, again, th- I'm tasting these for the first time the same time you guys are. So um, I, I, th- this is the first one that I've tasted, mm. and I'm actually very pleased how this one came out. It's real tasty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wish – it's a, it's um, it's not dry, Mm-mm. but there's a there's a strong alcohol presence there. But I think you're going to be surprised with this one. Yeah. So, uh, this one was the uh, 1728 Scottish Ale. Huh. Uh, again, the beginning gravity was 1120. 
This one, the final gravity was 1.007, which means the uh, measured alcohol by volume was 14.9%, which is why it's hot. Yep. But the uh, listed potential alcohol by volume on this one was only 12%. Hmm. Hmm. So it outdid itself. Yes, and that is the power of nutrients. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are what you eat. Wow. Well, that's um, like I say that the nose is to me all about canned corn. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't I, I can't get much past that. Um, what's your what's your taster tasting, Steve? What is that? I get the corn. I, I think I get the sweetness, and the the mouthfeel is real heavy in mm. my mouth. I mean, it's not unpleasant, but it's uh, that's a dessert mm. for me. This this drink is something I might I might have, you know, uh, in front of the fireplace after my meal. Mm. That's the way it strikes me. Interesting. Well, they they're not going to get any lighter. Uh, well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we might be having pancakes by the end. <laughs> Well, All right. We brought plenty of water. All right. Um, we will uh, we'll rinse, and then we'll go to uh, to the next one. So the next bottle is going to be a bottle number six. So this is contestant number six. It's a good little dancer. Yeah, I feel like it's a mixture Ooh. between Hollywood Squares and Dealer No Deal. It's way different than the nose. Oh, yeah. Let me get some vanilla. It's more spicy. Well, I'm not. I'm not picking up. I'm, this one, I w- if I had to pick a word for this one, the word would be clean. Yeah. If anything, I'm picking up a little bit of um, back in the '70s, those cheap air mattresses. Do you remember those? That kind of plasticky. Yeah. Now, did you in? Uh, take some of those in your meat experiment. They eventually kind of uh, uh, aged out. Well, what we were getting was a bit of a rubber bandy kind of a thing, but you know, uh, it it lessened or went away uh, over time. I actually drank one of our. Uh, I think I had a blood orange about two weeks ago with dinner, and uh, it had it was very clean. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. Okay, I'm going to taste here. Mm-hmm. Mm. I would say that that's um, a bit more fruity, a bit more sweet, and I would say um, maybe more orangey. So maybe the yes. maybe more the flavor of the uh, of the the honey is coming through here. Right. So you want to take a guess of which which yeast this is? Hmm. No, I have oh. no clue. Oh, no, that's that's very nice, though. Yeah. So I would let me take a stab in the dark. The sweet mead. No, this was the dry mead. Oh, close. Yeah, very close. Forty six thirty two dry mead. Uh, final gravity was ten eleven. Uh, the measured ABV is fourteen point four percent. Interestingly enough, though, the potential ABV for this one is listed at eighteen percent. So this one came uh-huh. in under. Wow. Hmm. It's definitely more pleasant than the first one. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Which, which may be what we discover from this. You know, mm. I'm, well, I'm interested to get down to the American ale one. That should be uh, very interesting. Well. Wow. Well, no, I kind of like the Scottish ale one. Do you? Yeah, I did. Um, I like this one as well. But yeah. I didn't have have the negative. Like this is certainly more pleasant was you guys' comment and I'm like, Well this is good too. <laughs> Steve never met a mead he didn't like. Oh I think a mead is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> or maybe that's a mind, I don't know. <laughs> the mind of the mead and the mead of the mind. Well I mean the first one was okay, it's just that you know, that kind of uh, uh corny um uh-huh. smell was really not off-putting, but a little distracting, I'd say. This yeah. one actually finishes a lot cleaner in your mouth, in my yeah. mouth, anyway. Yeah. The first one, I think, is as as with all things mead, give it time and it'll change and it'll be better. Mm-hmm. So. All right. On shall to, we proceed on? On to the sink. 
Steve is, uh, hey, he's got dishwasher duty tonight. So our next uh, bottle is going to be bottle number seven. Bottle number seven. I'll open while you wash. How about that? This is either, either bottle number seven or bottle number L. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's li- Lily Tomlin to block. <laughs> One ringy dingy. <laughs> Of course, we're, we, every time we get on together, Steve, we just we, every time we get on together, Steve, we just prove how old we are. I know we haven't uh, <laughs> seen, our, a, seen a comedy since 1978. Is that it? <laughs> well, we could do some Seinfeld references. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, number seven. Number seven. Number seven. Number seven. Hmm. We're back to just a, not as much of the corn uh, smell as the first one, but just a teeny yeah. bit. And I, I think we're, I'm, I'm finding a pattern here. I'll, I'll give you my thoughts when we get when we get into it. Hmm. Oh, no, I, I, I think this one's nice. It's pretty. It's clean. Yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that this is the uh, 1056. You would be incorrect. <laughs> Strike two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just enjoying this one. Give me a moment. Hmm. I just have no idea, earthly idea, what this could, you know. Ooh, it may be my tasty. palate, but I'm getting a little bit of a uh, little bit of a uh, tart in that one. It may just be the hotness. Mm-hmm. I think it's pretty fiery. Really? Yeah. I get a I get a pretty good alcohol note at the end. I think my tongue is numb. See, that's the danger with this stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's our third half ounce, and uh, we're already. Hmm. But I I like this one quite a lot. Yeah, it's plenty sweet. It's um, it's very, very clean. There's not, not too many, you know, fruity esters or, um, yeah, that's, that's very drinkable. Um, maybe a little too drinkable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that's what they call mead, the drink of love. It gets a little drinkable. It gets dangerous. <laughs> and you know where that can go. Well, <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, so give us a bottom line on this. <laughs> What's the yeast on this guy? So this one is the 1762 Belgian Abbey 2. Okay. Uh, the uh, final gravity was 1014. The measured alcohol by volume was right at 14%, but the potential alcohol by volume was 12%. Huh. So my thought is here is that the reason why we got so much DMS in the third, in the third one and not so much in the second is that in these two, the uh, ABV actually outstripped the, the alcohol uh, potential of the yeast, the alcohol tolerance. Huh. And perhaps pushing the alcohol past its tolerance is causing the emergence of the DMS in the meat. Huh. I got a little bit of a kind of an astringency at the very end of that one hmm. in my palate. Did either of you pick that up? Maybe I, it's just me. That, okay. that might be what is coming across as tartness to me. Ah. Could very well be. Okay. The next suitcase. Uh, so time to rinse. So the next one <laughs> going down the list is going to be number five. Number five. I would assume there wouldn't be any variance in color as we go along. You never know. I wouldn't be surprised. You wouldn't think. I, I think that there has been. I think really? the first one was quite a bit um, more golden than this. I mean, a richer color. Hmm. Uh, that was one thing that I really noticed about it. And as soon as you mentioned that, you know, just now, I... I happened to pick this one up, and this is much more straw-colored. It's much huh. lighter, visually. Oh, you getting a little I'm get, off I'm, something there? I'm getting a little rubber band. Yeah, I yes. agree. I am too. Yeah, yeah. It's a um, it's a different flavor, a rubber band, than what we had. <laughs> yeah. ours, ours was more of the Chicago Tribune style of rubber band. Ours, Those big yes. honking rubber bands, you know. Yeah, ours this, was, this is more of the Denver Post rubber band. Uh, see, our, our rubber band had been out in the yard a couple of days. <laughs> Got a little higher quality rubber going. 
Yeah, there's yeah, there is a, a bit of a um oh. Yeah, I get that mm. in the in the palette mm. too. Yeah. That's uh it's um This wasn't made with orange blossom honey, this was made with agent orange. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not yeah. that bad. But there's some strong rubber band yeah, it, in that, the nose it, and the palate. That needs a bit more aging in the... Uh, yeah, it might come yeah. around in a year. Yeah. I mean, the mouthfeel is just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sweetness level is just fine. Yeah. It's just that there's that... Yeah. There's a bit of a... Yeah. I don't want any more of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't waste the calories at my age. <laughs> or the brain So stuff. this this one was the 2565 Kolsch. The Kolsch. Mm-hmm. Huh. Final gravity was 1027. Uh, this is another one where the ABB outstripped the tolerance. The ABB was 12.2, and the tolerance was 10. Ah. So, so maybe the maybe the yeast was overcharged a little bit, or overstressed. Hmm. Yeah, because yeah. the because the Kolsch is to make a light beer. Hmm. You know, you know, a, a lower gravity. Right. Beer and so yeah, it would it would stress it with all that stuff. Yeah, okay. so this one is one where I would probably, if I were wanting to make one of these a mead with this yeast, I would start at a lower ABV, uh, probably back off on the nutrients a bit and uh, let it go dry and back sweeten perhaps. Okay, so now we're on to number two, bottle number two, bottle number, bottle two. number two. Okay, number two is. Um Oh, now that smells that smells great. This is the Bavarian wheat. You think so? It's my guess. There's a there's a little bit banana there in there. Yeah, that's a that's a. Oh, yeah. I like that. I yeah, like that's that nice. That's my that's my favorite uh, smelling one so far. That has got all the meat characteristics. Oh, mm. in. That's my. We have a winner, folks. Oh my! It's, it's clean. It's fruity. It's got the honey character in it. It's got the nice uh, smell. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's like that a annoying this. cheap aftershave going in here. <laughs> now, this I will tell you that wow. there is a, a mead by Rabbit's Foot that won the best of show or the, or the best of single varietal mead at the International Mead Festival this year. Oh, my. And this comes close. Mm. That's really good. That's kind of like a fruit salad. You know, you got the little yeah. bit of the orange in there. You got a little bit of the banana. Yep. That is fantastic stuff. Boy, that's I, I, nice. I'm going to be hoarding this. <laughs> Steve's already got the bottle in his pocket, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. This mercy, is... mercy, mercy. <laughs> yeah, that was a meat, hit. Meat almost came out my nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are worse places. Um... <laughs> that's tasty. Yeah. Boy, no kidding. Yes. So, are so we ready it, for the big reveal? Yeah, mm-hmm. am I right? Is this the Bavarian wheat? It is not the Bavarian I wheat. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Which this one is it? This is the uh, 1056 American Ale. Oh, really? Get out of town. Well, there you go. Final gravity on this one was 1029, so very sweet. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that according to the, the stuff that I've seen, oh. the, the the alcohol tolerance is only 10%, but this one went up to 12 Huh. But yet it didn't but, have the nastiness of the other. And look how beautiful no. this one is. Yeah, it's nice it's, and clear. Wow. That that is pale. one that I'm putting a big check mark next to because that one came out well. Yeah, that's nice. Mm. Yeah, maybe having some more of that after that may be one that we don't put the cap back on. That might yeah. be the case. That might be one I'll have to make a bigger batch of. I think. Yeah, that's nice. Definitely. Really? That one. That one is maybe contest worthy right there. That's that's fantastic stuff. Yeah, very good. Wow. Hmm. Excellent. All right. On to our next one. Looking down the list here, it looks like our next winner is going to be number eight. Number eight. Bottle number eight. Hmm. This has almost kind of a nutty mm-hmm. smell. Hmm. Not, uh, it's not as – after the 1056, this is not as much happening. I, yeah. You know, I'm not getting anything off of it except a little not. nutty – Ness, which I agree with you on that. It's, hmm. Although it, it's pleasant. I think that 1056 was so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's ruined our palates. A little bit, but this is actually pretty good. It's it's yeah. flatter, though. You know, it doesn't have yeah. it doesn't sparkle. Yeah. 
in my palate as much. And there's okay. at the end again, there's just a little bit of a. It's not almond. Is it almond? There's like a little bit at the very end uh, that lingers on your tongue, kind of a a nutty yeah. aftertaste. Not, but uh, it's not, not unpleasant. unpleasant. No, no. It's just going a completely di- different direction from the one before. I actually like this. It's it's, uh-huh. it's enjoyable. And definitely something that I could look for in maybe uh, a holiday meat or something like that to bring out some of the, some of the nutty flavors. That's actually you know quite mm. enjoyable. This would be really good with fruit cake, you know, because of the nuts. I mean, it would yeah. it would pair well. There's few things that you can say this would be good with fruit cake, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. other than a trash can. <laughs> uh, yes. So this one was the 1388 Belgian Strong. Hmm. Mm. This is one which was kind of reversed. The final gravity was 1038. Uh, the alcohol by volume measured was 10.8%. The potential, though, the tolerance was 12. So this one came in under potential. Huh. Now, I'm liking this more as I drink it. I mean, I did, I, it's not that I didn't like it at first. I liked it at first. Now I'm, I'm liking it more with every little sip. Yes. So our next one is going to be number three. Number three. <laughs> You're good at that. I'm the Ed McMahon of. Uh... You are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I knew the laugh was coming. You're right, sir. <laughs> You're right, sir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's more of Phil Hartman doing. I can't do actual celebrities. What I do is people imitating celebrities. Okay. Back hmm. to business. This yeah. has got a little rubber band happening. Yeah, I agree. Yes, it does. It's right there. Yep. Huh. But there's a little something else happening there, too. It's, I think it's more pleasant than the other rubber bands. Well, the Kolsch one was just nasty. nasty. It was just bad. Yeah. This has some potential. It's maybe just not mm. ready. Yeah. It's not horrible. Yeah. It's very, it's, um, I do get some kind of like I'm chewing on an old rubber mattress. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. But, this um, one needs to age, definitely. Yeah. But it's not horrible. This is one that once it does rubber band out, it's sweet enough to where I probably end up adding a little acid blend to offset the sweetness. Yeah, I was going to say it is very sweet. Um, and the more I drink of it, the more <laughs> <laughs> I'm already drink of it, the more I like. <laughs> no, but the, okay, I'll say I'll do like Steve and save save calories and brain cells, and we'll pour that one out. Now who? Who fermented that? That was the 1968 London ESB. Ah. Uh, final gravity, of course, was 1044. So again, very very sweet. Ooh, goodness. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the things about doing an experiment like this. You have to pick a, a starting gravity and run with it. So I knew some of these were going to come out very sweet. Um, this one evened out on the alcohol by volume and the alcohol tolerance, both of them at 10. percent Ah, hmm. So it's right on. Right but, on. But yet it still had uh, a bit of the rubber andy stuff. Yeah, and that may have been maybe, you know, for this yeast, the common amount of nutrient that I used was too much for this specific yeast. Huh. And it could have been. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, of, that, a lot of that data that we're going to get out of this that I think is going to be very valuable going out. So, so you're saying it has, like it's. That, that perhaps had you used less yeast nutrient, we might have gotten a better final product at the moment. Is that – am I understanding you right? Correct. It may not have been still rubber bandy up front. Okay. Huh. Well, very interesting. Okay. All right. We're down so, to our last two contestants. We have contestant yes. number one and contestant number four. So, so here's the funny part about this one. These two both came out at 9.5 alcohol by volume. Both yeasts were have an alcohol tolerance of 10%, so it came in under tolerance. Both of them ended at 1048, and the only two that are left are the Bavarian wheat blend and the sweet mead. Mm-hmm. So we get to, we get to, we have a 50-50 chance of guessing this one. <laughs> and I'll probably so we're gonna get do it wrong. Uh, number four. Number four. <laughs> <laughs> Daring do. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you can tell if there have been any darings in your yard. <laughs> <laughs> it's my only Johnny Carson joke I can remember. 
<laughs> the only Johnny Carson joke I can remember was when he was doing his his predictions. I forget oh, what like, he called himself when he was doing that. Karnak. That, that, that was a Karnak. Yeah. yeah. Karnak. So he said uh, he held the envelope up to his head and said, um, "A mouse in a trap, Queen Elizabeth's crown, and John McEnroe." A mouse in a trap, Queen Elizabeth's crown, and John McEnroe. Named a foiled rat, a foiled hat, and a spoiled brat. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) All right. I get just a little bit of rubber bandiness at the front. It's not not an unpleasant uh, aroma, but not a pleasant aroma. Right. It tastes pretty good, though. Hmm? Very sweet. Tastes better than it smells. <laughs> it's very sweet, yet not syrupy. Right. And very clear. This is amazing clear. At, this, at, this, uh, at this gravity. <clears throat> very clear. Amazingly clear. Hmm. It's All good. All the wonders it's of really good. Uh, I mean, this cold is, crashing your mead. It just needs to, to balance out that la- that little bit of rubber band at the front end it, for me, and then mm-hmm. man, this would be really nice. Yeah. So I'm gonna guess. Okay. I'm gonna go with the Bavarian wheat. I'm stuck on that. Okay. You'd be correct. <laughs> You're correct this time. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's not as good as the 1056, <clears throat> which I guess is our favorite so far, huh? Oh, yeah. Hands down. I have to agree. All right. Oh, and, and d- did you say the specifics of this one? Yes. These last two are the same. They are, oh, that's uh, right. That's right. I'm sorry. 1048 and 9.5% alcohol. Hmm. That's got a bit of a, an acidic bite to it, just a little, a little bit. That may um, mm-hmm. kind of balance out the sweetness there. And then the last one is number one, and I'm going to guess which one this one is. Uh, <laughs> Go for it. I'm going to say this is a, the uh, American Ale, the 1056 again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm I'm hoping for. No, it's a, it is the sweet meat. Oh, yeah. No, no trickies in here besides the order. Ooh. So now, this one has a long and storied history um, about being inconsistent, but I think part of that comes from inexperienced mead makers making their first mead, and of course they go straight for the sweet mead yeast, uh-huh. and they don't properly um, nutrient and uh, aerate, and they just have an inconsistent experience with it. So hmm. it's got a, um... huh? It's got a kind of a, I want to say dark aroma, or kind of a, you know, the, the aroma has kind of lower notes as, as mm-hmm. opposed to higher notes. Mm-hmm. I think this is the Comes best, up. this is the best balanced mead, and this is mm. the one that has the most, I really mm. get that nice orange honey flavor from this more than any other, any of them. Even the American? E- even the American, huh. except mm. for, because I thought the American had a lot of overtones, a lot of of fruit notes that yeah. weren't honey notes. <clears throat> they were they were very good. Some banana stuff. Some banana, some you know, mm-hmm. this and that. But this is this is honey. Mm-hmm. This is this is honey and nothing else. And it's wonderful. Yeah. It's very clean. That's nice. It's very clean. It's it might be a little cloyingly sweet, and that's just because of course we have to start with a higher gravity, so that's right. easy to, to fix by bringing the original gravity down and just letting it do its thing. Uh-huh. Proper aeration, proper nutrients. And it'll come down and, and uh, you know, it hit its, its, uh, its alcohol tolerance if you do that well. Oh, that's very nice. It's very nice. I still uh, want to give the crown for the night to the 1056, though. Yeah. I as far so. as just the, the overall flavor, it had the most going. It was really, really good. Hmm. I would have to agree with that, which is, which is amazing that, you know, you, you think that there's a lot of difference in these meads, in these yeasts, but... Maybe it's also the medium that you're uh, fermenting that uh, that uh, determines what your final product comes out to be. 
I mean, we've got a, I mean, you, the variance here was was broad, mm-hmm. very broad. Yeah, it's it's interesting that it you know they're all they're all yeast, um, but they've been isolated for so long. All these different strains and have, have done their things in different environments so long that they've developed different characteristics, um, and that they're I mean they it it really does make a difference what strain of yeast that you get. I mean, you know, when I, when I first started doing kits, you know, it came with kind Mm -hmm. of a generic beer yeast. Um, and you know, you get, you get a decent beer with it, but where I think one of the ways that you can step out and, and go beyond being just a, you know, kind of a basic uh, brewer, so to speak, is to tailor your ingredients toward the styles that you're, you're looking for in beer and in mead. Um, and I think that we've proven that you you don't when doing meads you don't have to stick to the the uh, the yeasts that have the word mead on the name label. You know you can right. step out and 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 find some other yeasts um, and do some experimenting. Absolutely. Now the fun thing here is, is that most cases the uh, the variance in mead came from the honey. So you'd use a different honey to get for a different flavor in the mead. Uh-huh. Now we're looking at expanding out into different yeasts just beyond uh, wine yeasts. And uh, the combinations that you get going out of this just multiply and multiply. And we haven't, by any stretch of the imagination, hit every single possible ale or even lager oh, yeast. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just and, – and I'm even thinking you – you could uh, even go so far as to mix yeasts as well. Yeah, yeah. Old you know, boy. you could blend. I mean, <laughs> well, it gets true. exponentially more complicated and, and hard to predict, but maybe that's the fun of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Except, oh, and, that, and, except uh, that honey's expensive. <clears throat> and yes, and thank goodness for the one-gallon batch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all about the small batch. That's right. Oh, and, absolutely. And while yes. I'm thinking of it, we have to give credit to David Myers of, uh, of Redstone Meadery because uh, – you know, I think it's from the from a conversation with him. Uh, you know, and he was talking about using different beer yeasts in his meads. I think that that's where it came uh, about. You know, where the idea came from that we would use beer yeasts in our mead yeast experiment to begin with. So, mm-hmm. you know, kudos to to David Myers um, of Redstone. Indeed. And now that I have a lager fridge, maybe there's a lager yeast meat mm. experiment sometime in the future. Well, you keep sending the bottles, yeah. Mike, and we'll you know <laughs> we'll knuckle down and <laughs> we'll break out our demi tasse tasters. <laughs> Indeed. Well, this has been fun and very Absolutely. useful. Yes, I'm very glad. This this was a, a, an amazing amount of work. I didn't think it was going to be a lot of work, but it turned out to be a lot more work than I thought, and uh, we've got a very good result here, and I'm very, very pleased with how this came out. And I'm very glad you guys could be be here uh, to help me taste and to uh, be there the first time they were cracked open. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much for letting us be a part. It's my pleasure. Well, thanks again to Mike Lozano, and thanks to the Y Yeast guys for donating the yeast for the test. And thanks for Steve livening things up with our salute to the mighty Carson Art players there. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. Uh, it'll be fun to taste those again in a few months to see how they progress over time. That's, uh, that's part of the fun of mead making, if you can be patient enough to wait. Next week, Garrett Marrero from Maui Brewing Company joins us to talk about how he got into the brewing business and to give us a bit of a peek into how they make their award-winning Maui Gold Summer Ale and their Coconut Porter. Just makes me thirsty thinking about it. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from, and please check your email, make sure it's correct. I had a couple of bounce, bounce back to me here recently. So uh, if that, you know, if it takes me more than a week to get to your email, I'm not ignoring you. Uh, I just don't know where you are. Uh, And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can uh, find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. 
In our first DVD, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process step by step from boiling to bottling. And in basic brewing, stepping into all grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And, uh, you know, I'm just wa- looking at the count, looking at my watch, waiting for the next DVD. Our uh, low tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD should be in the next oh, couple weeks, maybe, I hope. And uh, also, the uh, our uh, 2008 Brewers logbook is at the printers. And so we hopefully should be seeing those very soon as well. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online from our store. Remember, we also have shirts and hats, and uh, including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. It's getting a little cold up here in the in north of the equator, but, you know, it's getting warm. should be getting warm down south. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who's uh, continued to click on our Amazon.com link as well. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Ending Aging, the rejuvenation breakthroughs that could reverse human aging in our lifetime. Maybe picking up a copy of that. And Hypatia? Hypatia? Hypatia. One of those may be (laughs) close to being correct. Hypatia of Alexandria, mathematician and martyr. The first part would look good on a resume. The second part, not much use. But (laughs) thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, but uh, don't worry about that. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. And we appreciate your support there. That's it. It's all until next week. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down in Austin. We also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.